Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode 76 of Teaching Tales, the podcast totally devoted to sharing stories from the world of education. I am Brent Coley, your host and elementary principal in beautiful Southern California. And joining me today, speaking of beautiful, <laughs> I, I now we've had episodes before for, for listeners. You know, I've had a few family members on. I've had my dad. I think it was episode six. More recently, I had my daughter Megan episode. I don't remember, <laughs> but I have another family member with me. I have my beautiful wife, Jill. Hi, babe. Hello. Thank you. So, <laughs> so before we get into the topic today, Jill, first of all, I love you, babe. Tell us about um, who, who are who's Jill. Well, like you said, I am the wife of Brent Coley. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am a mother to two. Um, Megan is our 19-year-old daughter in her first year of college. And Ben is our 15-year-old son in his first year of high school. And then professionally, um, I am the director of child and family programs at a local foster care and adoptions agency here in Temecula, International Christian Adoptions. And I'm a social worker, and I have been in social work and uh, specifically child welfare for about 25 years. Yes, you have extensive background in the uh, in the field. And we were talking, kind of this episode came about because um, we were talking the other night, a, a week or so ago, just about uh, trauma and trauma-informed practices and specifically like kids who come with trauma from the foster care system, things like that. And I thought, gosh, you know what? We were, we had such a great conversation. And I remember saying, we should have been recording this. Like, mm-hmm. this is what teachers, principals, anyone in education, they need to hear this stuff mm-hmm. because it's good stuff. So what I wanted to do is, is, is record, hopefully we can get a great conversation like that again. Mm-hmm. With the topic being, what is a teacher, principal, assistant principal, anyone in education, what do they need to know about students who may be coming to their schools or their classrooms Mm -hmm. from the foster care system? Because as a site principal, we're... They're they're there. They are in mm-hmm. every one of our schools, and the numbers, the percentages of those kids, it continues to rise. Mm-hmm. And we just need to have a better knowledge of how can we best serve those kids. And I've got an expert living mm-hmm. in my home, so let's tap into that. So, okay. so I said, Jill, share with listeners, my mom and dad, if nobody <laughs> else, what. What, what does a teacher need to know? I think you said you came up with like yeah. five, five things. So what mm-hmm. would number one mm-hmm. be? Well, speaking of numbers, um, you know, I thought I would share some stats um, just so people are aware that um, on any given day in our nation, we have uh, about 440,000 children in the foster care system. Um, right here in California, on an average day, it's about 60,000. Um, and the average age of ch- children that are in foster care is between seven to eight years old. So they are school aged mm-hmm. children. And if I, again, if we look at the numbers, about 60% um, of the children that are in the system, they are school aged. They are in school. So like you said, they're definitely in your classrooms. Mm-hmm. They're on your campuses. There's no doubt about it. So um, first, I would say it's just really important for educators to know who are those students. Um, Just be aware um, that they are foster children, um, just so they can feel safe on the campus, that they can feel seen um, and just cared for and valued um, without stigmatizing them, though. Sure. You know, Absolutely. because they already, they're very aware that they're very different than uh, mm-hmm. most of the children on campus. They're very aware that they don't have the families um, like the other kids do. So it's that balance of, you know, uh, knowing that they're there and um, investing in them and making them feel safe, but at the same time, not wanting to, to stigmatize them. I think some of the important things is to be aware, um, like for example, like around uh, projects maybe in the classroom that are specifically about families, you know, like Mother's Mother's Day comes up, Father's Day, 
just being aware, um, you know, and sensitive to the fact that that could be very difficult for those children. Holidays are always really, really difficult um, for foster children. Um, so just being aware around some of those other things. I have one um, mother that um, I've worked with that she was sharing with me the other day that her son that she has now adopted he shared with her when he first came to live with her um, how there was one Valentine's Day that he um, he was living in a foster home and he showed up to school and he was the kid that had no Valentine's to pass out. Mm -hmm. Everyone else did, but he didn't. Um, same thing like with special like, you know, dress up days or cowboy day or whatever, you know, he didn't have you know, a cowboy no, hat to wear. No one there to make the costume or to, right. to get the hat. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So even if, you know, I was thinking that even if like teachers, like Valentine's Day, they had like one extra box of Valentine's, mm -hmm. you know, just in case <laughs> that kid shows up and doesn't have, you know, so just again, being aware of, you know, those things. Um, and that could be, if I, if I mm -hmm. can hear, for whether it's a foster child or any kiddo. Right. I mean, just right. shoot, having an extra, if you're doing mm -hmm. a project or an activity like that, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. that backup plan for, for that student who mm -hmm. may come, Not, quote unquote, right. unprepared mm -hmm. for Valentine's or whatever right. it is. Right. Yeah. And there definitely needs to be, um, you know, some improvement. You know, there's been some improvements with, um, you know, the collaboration between like child welfare and school districts in just communicating and letting Child welfare needs to let, you know, schools know yeah. that, you know, um, that this child's been placed in foster care. They're, you know, now being enrolled in your school. And there have been some improvements, but definitely that's an ongoing, you know, we need to see improvements in that area. Yeah, we, we especially where we live in California, for anyone listening in California, or, I mean, we know who our English language learners are. Mm -hmm. Students in our schools, in our classrooms, we know who are students who English is not their primary language. Mm -hmm. And and so that we, why? So that we know what kind of support to provide for those kids needs right. to be the same type of thing. Because much like an English language learner would require some additional supports, mm -hmm. someone, a child in the foster care system is probably going to require right. some additional supports. supports. Exactly. And I know a lot of times... Um, you know, teachers and principal, you're not finding out sometimes that they're even on your campus until the family, the foster family mm -hmm. has shared with you. Yeah. And that needs to change. We need to, you know, there needs again, be more collaboration where you're finding out um, even ahead of time. Like I know you were yeah. saying, you know, that it's really helpful to know even before that school, that yeah. child steps foot on your campus just to be prepared. So the next thing that I wanted to share that I'm really excited about, and this is, um, you know, what we share with all the uh, families that we're preparing um, to care for these children is that um, in recent, just like in the past 10 to 12 years, there has been all kinds of uh, neuroscience research. Oh, I love this. Yeah, all around. <laughs> Turn um, it up, folks. This is good stuff. Yeah, from it, it's exciting. It's, it's all around what trauma does to a child's brain. So we now know um, just the effects of, and when we say trauma, you know, uh, a lot of times we call it toxic stress, um, adverse childhood experiences. So obviously we're talking about abuse and neglect, um, abandonment. We're talking about um, being exposed to drugs and alcohol in utero. Um, so all those things that just that cause that toxic stress and it really just derails the natural development of the child's growing brain. Um, and so we know what it does. Um, what happens is that these kids, they get stuck um, in the flight, fight or freeze. Fight or flight. Um, so they're like constantly in this state of, um, you know, <coughs> thinking that there's danger and just scanning for danger. And their brain is in that place. They're stuck where you can imagine, like, what does that do for learning? Like, can, can they learn when they're stuck there, yeah. you know? Um, children that are afraid have a hard time learning. Um, so what I would say is really important for educator, educators is to be what we call uh, trauma-informed, mm -hmm. um, have uh, trauma-informed classrooms, and just be aware of what, you know, what does trauma do to a child's brain? What does that look like? Now, the good news is, the exciting news is that there's hope. Yes. And that is, is that the damage can be reversed. So again, there is scientific proof that the, the damage can be reversed 
And the way that that it's reversed is um, all through connections and relationships. So it that's really exciting uh, to know that um, you know we literally can um, change the brain chemistry, change the wiring of the brain um, by children having safe adults in their life that are connecting with them, um, just really getting down on their level. Um, there's real specific strategies like eye contact, um, gentle touch, um, soft words. Uh, there's just all kinds of, uh, there's interventions. The specific intervention we teach our families is called trauma um, uh, based, uh, I'm sorry, trust-based uh, relational intervention. So again, it's all about relationships and connections. So it's just exciting to think and, and teachers and principals and it, it's it's just huge the role that you can play. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just the simple things. It's just really, again, taking that time to see that child, you know, to, to talk with them, get down on their level, make those connections and it's just exciting to think that, you know, that over time, like that can repair, literally repair the, the trauma, the damage, the damage that's, that's been, been done to the brain. Yeah. And so, I mean, you and I have talked, it's <laughs> chapter two, power of relationships right. in my book. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and bet you talked, touched on it too. It's the little things, power of the little things is another thing that I believe in. It doesn't have to be noticing a kid's shoes, noticing, Wow. I like that bow in your hair. I like, right. hey, how'd you do in your soccer game? Right. Little things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who's listening or if you if you know someone who was like, that's ah, just a bunch of fluff. It's overhyped, something like that. What you're saying is there's brain research that's, to show. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, yeah, that's it's not fluff. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's science. It's neuroscience. It's science. It's like evidence-based, <clears throat> proven research. Um, and I think we were talking about that. Maybe you can put some links, yes. um, you know, some resources for people to, so that I would encourage educators. I mean, I know you guys have a full plate. You got a lot going on, but if you can take some time to just become again, a little bit more trauma informed educators and yeah. just, you know, knowing, uh, you know, just what that modern, um, science, which that research shows. And like I said, it's very exciting. Um, everyone that, uh, you know, learns about it is very excited, you know, to know that, um, we can make a difference. There's hope. Mm -hmm. And I will put, uh, if, if anyone, if you're listening and you're interested in that, if you go to brentcoley.com on the podcast page, mm -hmm. uh, under episode 76, uh, I will have, there are some links there that you can, uh, check out. Perfect. So. Perfect. So what else What else do we yeah, need to know? Yeah, so the next thing I would say is around behavior, you know, because, you know, we, we all know that... Um, there are going to be behaviors yes, typically yeah. associated. Yes, yeah, these children, can they can be difficult, you know, um, understandably. You know, again, I always tell people, well, <laughs> Look what you know, gone think about what they've been through. Um, so I think it's really important that we reframe behavior so that we... Don't think of it as... Um, reframe. Reframe. Yes. Reframe. No. Okay. So that we don't think of it as like willful disobedience or <laughs> defiant or, you know, that they're just, they're just a, you know, bad kid or they're just, they just want to push my buttons. What we want to do is we want to look at that behavior as what we call survival strategies or uh, very much a fear-based behavior. Mm -hmm. So... The behavior, uh, what we like to say is that it's a language of unmet needs. So the behavior mm. is, it's telling you something, you know. Um, again, remember they're in that fight, flight, freeze mode. They're constantly scanning for danger in their world. And all their energy goes into that survival. Um, and again, like I said, fear, fearful children can't learn. Uh, they have a hard time focusing sure. <laughs> on reading and writing and math um, oh, and just following the social norms and rules. Um, that's very, very difficult for these kids when they're in the fear mode. Because um, mm -hmm. because social norms, mm -hmm. I, just the word norm sticks out. Right. Their normal mm -hmm. is not no. the right. typical normal for mm -hmm. most kids in our classrooms. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, you know, and uh, this isn't probably as uh, applicable in schools, but um, isolation as a consequence is really not typically very effective for these kids. Um, keep in mind that, uh, you know, they, they have, they've been abandoned. You know, there's a lot of abandonment uh. issues already. Um, so just real quick, what we, what we tell parents, and, you know, this could apply, um, 
is that, you know, if, for example, if you're going to use, um, like a lot of people use a timeout, time out. you know, yeah. type, you know, what we say is if you're going to do timeout, there needs to be two chairs. So mm. you're not leaving the child. You are there with the child. Building that relationship. Building that relationship, sitting at their level, eye contact, talking with them, helping them regulate, helping them calm down. Um, so that's just, I just wanted to throw that out there because that's, that's really key for these kids. And I can just say, when at all possible, that you could apply <laughs> across the board. Mm -hmm. Not just, I mean, right. just isolating your bench yeah. your, your something like that mm -hmm. yeah step outside the classroom the, the, yeah which i mean and, and we're not and i will say for anyone not advocating no consequences no, for no, anything no. like that yeah. it's just mm -mm. that trying to be intentional mm -hmm. and what's the purpose of a con exactly we're looking to exactly to to teach we're right. looking to curb behavior to reteach in some cases and right and I again behavior to, behaviors sim they're symptoms they are symptoms of something else going on and behavior is a language um so yeah um the other thing uh, definitely you know keep in mind that their biological age is not going to match their developmental age which i know as educators you know you you know that um you know, some, sometimes it's easy, like, you know, children, when they have developmental disabilities, it's like, okay, yeah, we, we know that it's not sure. going to match. But sometimes, um, you know, these children, they present as your very typical children. And you would, know, you would have no idea by, like, looking at them um, or even, you know, talking sure. with them, you know, that there is, you know, um, just what they've been through, the trauma, sure. you know. But just... Um, just always keep that in mind that, that they're not going to be, you know, their biological age isn't going to match up. He's in third grade. So mm -hmm. I'm going to expect him yeah. potentially, well, he should be at a third grade level. Right. And, and not just academics, uh, probably socially you know, as well. Emotional. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely social skills. They're processing, regulating all of that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, these kids fall through the cracks a lot because they're not impaired enough to qualify for like special services like IEPs and those kinds sure. of things, but they are impaired enough to not thrive in the sure. classroom and not thrive in schools and not be able to function. So a lot of times they fall through the cracks. Well, they're, and if, cause if they're bouncing around, right, that was my school, next point. Yeah, exactly. School to school to school to school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They may not necessarily be in one place long enough to, exactly. to get that SST role yeah. to get an assessment mm -hmm. role. Oh, we were just about to do something and yep. boom, they're gone. Right. And then the, the process starts all, all over, over in the next school and then boom, yeah. they're gone again. So that was my next point. Oh, there we go. They miss, a, they miss a lot of school. Um, a lot of them we find when they're entering the system, they haven't even been attending school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they were like living on the streets with their parents or just their parents, you know, they were, you know, just because of the drug and alcohol use, you know, kids just, they weren't going to school. Um, and then, yes, once they get in the system, yes, transferring a lot, you know, from school to school to school. Um, also, um, just sometimes like just the transferring and then time that like, gets lost in the registering and records having to be transferred. Uh -huh. And, you know, uh, uh, there's just so many things. But there are stats. There's a research that shows with every move, they lose about four to six months of academic progress. So let's pause for a second. Say that again for anyone. <laughs> okay, so with every move that the child has to make to a new school, they lose about four to six months of academic progress. So again, I'm at an elementary level. So for anyone listening, think of where you are, what grade level you you of students you work with. You got a fifth grader who's been to five different schools. Mm -hmm. You can do the math mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. And that's that's Wow. And the average foster child um, moves about five, uh, five or more times, like in the, the, throughout the time that they're in foster care. So two, two to, two to three years, mm -hmm. two to three years. And, of yeah. I have an example um, of a young child that I just recently placed in a home. So she started kindergarten in one school and then she moved in the middle of her kindergarten year to a second school. And she finished kinder there and started first there, but then she moved again in the middle of her first grade year. So she now is in her third school, and she's only in first grade. First grade. 
So there's a real life example of wow. that happening. Yeah. And there's also some studies that show a correlation between foster children and the number of school moves, like the more school moves that they make and not graduating from high school. So there's definitely... The chance of not graduating mm-hmm. is increasing with every... Yep. with every. Yeah. So there's a direct correlation for sure. Wow. Yeah. Um, the third thing that I wanted to share, I think I'm on my third thing, um... Is about is about foster families. I was I was yeah. that's amazing because you had not to, told me but that was that <laughs> no. was going to be my question. What what can we do? What can we do? Yeah. To support the foster families. Yeah, um, I would say okay. So first thing I want to say is just be very um, kind and compassionate towards mm-hmm. them. Um, they get a you know there's a lot of bad rap, a lot of stigma around uh, foster families. Uh, the media you know, always wants to highlight um, the negative, you know, yeah. and movies sometimes don't portray them very yeah. positively. I can say with full confidence, it, being in this field for 25 years, there are some of the best amazing, hearted. amazing families out there. Just, they're superheroes. Yeah. Um, they, they are in the trenches working with these, you know, difficult children uh, day in and day out Um, so really you know they deserve a lot of respect Um, you know so don't be quick to judge you know just thinking Mm -hmm. oh you know foster care they must be doing it for the money trust me there's no money in it (laughs) (laughs) Um, so just as an educator I would just say you know take the time to thank them Um, you know acknowledge you know uh, the hard work they're doing Um, and ask them how they're doing um, ask them what you need to know about the child, you sure. know, like what, w- what can they share? Include them, um, in IEPs, SSTs, you know, communicate with them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, okay, they're not the legal parent, but they are the parent right now. They're the ones on the front line. They're they the need ones to be who, involved. Who yes. know what the triggers are, who know what right. the incentives that, that will motivate the child. What's working at are. home. Yeah. Right. Right. Definitely. Um, Also, I would say collaborate with the other professionals on that child's team. Um, So definitely these children, they need a team of people. (laughs) Um, So I would say, you know, reach out to the social worker if you have concerns or you just need to have better insight, better understanding of, you know, um, you know, sure, there's certain things, confidentiality, you know, that they're not going to be able to share, but there's a lot that they can share. So I would definitely say, you know, reach out and collaborate. Awesome. I guess that was my fourth thing. Yeah, I thought, okay. Yeah, so this is my fifth. Last one? <laughs> my fifth one is be ready for heartbreak. Ooh. Yeah. What do, you, what do you mean? Be prepared to say goodbye, which is... Because the stats, as you've yeah. previously mentioned, chances yeah. are... Right. They're right. going to... So whether they're um, moving to a new foster home or they're being reunified with their birth family... Okay. Or they're going to an adoptive home. Which is... Which is a good which thing. Which is a good thing. Um, that the child I was just telling you about that's now in her third, yeah. you know, it, because she's in an adoptive home now, which is a good thing. Which is a good thing. Unfortunately, she's one now... More, <laughs> one more move. Right, right. That, that, this will, is the last one. That'll be the last one. Um, so, yeah. Um, as an educator, you just need to be prepared uh, to feel that heartbreak. It can be very, very frustrating. Um, but you need to know, I just want to encourage educators, that you, um, you definitely, you plant seeds. And that you do make a difference. Yeah. And they will remember you. You can be that teacher that they remember uh, for life, for the rest of their, their life. Um, they might just look back um, and remember that, you know, when they think about all the safe adults that were in their life, the ones who really saw them, the ones who really cared, who really took the time to invest um you can be one of those adults. You can be on that list of people. She was the one that, when I did have to have a timeout, she sat next to me. Mm-hmm. She brought the second chair in. Right. And she talked to me. Right. She asked me how it was going at home. She. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I came to school and I, re- I remember that time I came to school and, you know, it was, it was dress up day. But, you know, I didn't. I didn't have a costume, yeah. but you know she had an extra cowboy hat for me to wear. Yeah, yeah. just again, it's the small things. Yeah. It really is the small things. So, yes, there's heartache, but you can make a difference. You know, um, so I wanted to encourage educators that way. 
Um, I do have one more quick thing, yeah. uh, if I can just throw it in there, is that you, know, as you all know, um, as educators, you are mandated reporters, and you know that. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know how important you know that is, and I want you to know that teachers and ed and principals, you are the first ones to pick up on abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. So there's a direct correlation between uh, CPS reports. Uh, declining drastically during the summertime because kids aren't in school. There's no one there to... Right. Wow. So they're definitely... Their advocates are Yes. Are, are <laughs> you, I mean, more than doctors. I mean, you, the educators are the ones who are picking up on abuse and neglect more than any other professional. So I just want to encourage you, um, you know, to take your being a mandated reporter very seriously yeah. um, and just know that... Your your role is key in, in when detecting. Because when you do it again as mandated reporters, we know when you suspect, you report, mm -hmm. and and when and you're not doing it to get somebody in in trouble. You're no. doing it right. for the child to make exactly. sure that that child is protected. And if it turns out to be nothing, great. But if right. it is something, again, right. that's 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 CPS. That's what they, I always tell people. I have a lot of teachers that will ask me, oh, they'll give me a scenario. Do you think I should call it in? Do you think... Oh, I always say always. yes. Yes, yep. always. If you have any kind of suspicion whatsoever, because it's not your job to be the investigator. Nope. That's oh, what they could pay yeah. for. Right, exactly. So I would just encourage <clears throat> encourage educators to take that role seriously. Awesome. Well, babe, this was good. Yeah, this, it was good. This, this was like the other conversation yeah, that we had. Yeah, so, thank you for I, the opportunity. Oh my gosh, thank you. Because I, I mean, as you're talking, I'm 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 picturing the students. We have we have foster kids at our mm -hmm. school, and I know anyone who's listening right now. If you're probably picturing those students in your class or those students in your school, and if you're listening right now and you're and you're asking yourself, I'm not sure who. If I have any, um, that's nothing. Don't don't feel bad about that. Mm -hmm. But I would say, if you're a teacher and, and you're not sure, ask mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow. Or if there aren't, if you're listening on a weekend, would you go in on Monday? Ask. Do I have any foster? I mean, again, hopefully the school, the district that you're working in, has that team mm -hmm. of of right, early liaison. intervention yeah. and and the liais liaison mm -hmm. that is yeah. is letting you know, hey, you've got someone who's coming in who's in foster care. But if not, if you're not sure. Ask, seek that out because again, that those efforts can make you can be that one mm -hmm. or, or one of the few adults in this child's right. life who can be a stable force. If only, like you said on your last, even if it, even if it's for mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. a month, right, just a or season, two, right. a, a, a season, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. you may be planting that seed that will blossom 10, 15 years mm -hmm. later into mm -hmm. a. a a strong oak tree that absolutely that, and, and you may not even get to sit under the shade of that tree right but right but you but you had a hand in planting right. that so make a difference yep for that sure. is <clears throat> that is awesome well babe thank you once again thank you and for anyone listening again if you go if you if you're interested in in some of the links that uh that jill was talking about on like some of the brain research and mm -hmm. things like that again go to brentcoley.com uh, slash podcast or just click on the podcast page and I will have the links there under episode 76. And uh, anything else, Jill, that you want to share? No. no. This is where yeah. I typically say, like, so if anyone wants, <laughs> wants to connect with you on social media, you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not on the, on the Twitters. I'm, yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> so, so that, and that's okay. And that's yeah. okay. So, again, I'm reminded, like, Weston Kichnick. Weston, if you're listening, I, I love your podcast, by the way. When you and Molly, you say, Molly, where can we find you? And she says, in in the drop-off loop at school or in Target <laughs> or at mm -hmm. gymnastics practice with the kids. So mm -hmm. you're, yeah. you're, you're picking up Ben from, yeah. from high school. At the high school. At yeah. the high school mm -hmm. at 3 o'clock in the afternoons, mm -hmm. battling traffic there. Right. So awesome. Well, thank you, babe. And thank you. And for those listening, thank you. We appreciate your support. If you if you got something out of this and you like it, again, tell a friend. It's, mm -hmm. uh, this, this episode, more than anything, because... I love all the episodes. I, I, I believe in all the ones we're recording. But this one, this has a special place in my heart because of who I'm married to. And mm -hmm. I and I know that just this one, this is important. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an underserved population mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that people don't, they don't know. They don't know a lot about this mm -hmm. or what can I do. So right. um, 
Thanks for listening. If you haven't done so, subscribe. Remember, we're in iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or you can listen directly on my website at brentcoley.com. Once again, thank you for listening, everyone. Until next time, have a good one.